a knight there was, a very worthy man, that from the time that he first began to ride abroad, he loved chivalry, truth and honor, freedom and courtesy, as well on Christian as on heathen earth, and ever honored for his noble worth. The first step in understanding colonialism is to separate the myth from the motive and to recognize that the myth is so often so noble that to displace it seems slightly obscene. The Conquering Knight belongs to the world of chess, a game that is universal. It is the archetypal game of conquest and dominion a metaphor of colonialism. The impulse of people to seek influence or dominion over lands far distant from their own is one of the great constants of history, the Romans, the French in Africa, the British in India, and so are its leading features. In the short run, the effort is a success, and in the long run, it is a failure. Invariably, the end is messy. The departure is usually sudden. The collapse is bloody, both for those leaving and those remaining behind. The departure from the colonial world has been less the result of the rising power of the colonial peoples than of the diminishing interest of those who leave. All modern empires, Spanish, British, French, American, Portuguese, maybe even Dutch and Belgian, could have been kept if the people of the metropolitan country had thought it worthwhile to do so. But they were no longer as willing to expend blood and treasure to keep the colonial territories as they once had been to win them. Also an important point, they were no longer willing to suspend disbelief as to their purpose in being there. The great prophets of 19th century capitalism, Smith, Ricardo, the rest, had surprisingly little to say about colonialism. They confined themselves to condemning the monopolization of colonial trade, exclusive privileges. Marx was more interested, and his views, repeated today, would cause surprise. Colonialism was a necessary and helpful step up from feudalism. The British in India were a progressive force. It was always agreed that the colonies did contribute to the prosperity of the capitalist world, yet the two countries with no colonies to speak of, Germany and the United States, enjoyed the greatest industrial growth of all. In fact, colonialism was taken for granted, and so was its myth. Nine hundred years ago, when the game of chess passed into Western Europe, its pieces had a firm physical reality. Their counterpart in life was the Crusaders and the Crusades. The myth was of men of the highest religious purpose, committed to the redemption of Jerusalem from the infidel and to saving the Eastern Christians in Constantinople from the Turks. The unavowed motive was land and wealth. Preaching the first crusade in Clermont, in 1095, Pope Urban II was careful to say that good property would be available for the Christian taking in the Holy Land. This was a deeply inspiring thought to the younger, landless sons of the Frankish nobility. And so beneath the cross beat hearts, responding to the age-old appeal of good real estate. The Holy Father, some scholars suggest, was also concerned with finding a job for the unemployed brigandage of Europe. Better to have them in Asia than in Europe. Arnold Toynbee flatly described the Crusades as belonging to the larger catalog of Western atrocities. The Crusades quickly achieved their most distant goal. Jerusalem was won, and so was the real estate that reinforced the commitment to the cross. <laughs> 
Baldwin I, the first king of Jerusalem, was himself diverted by a fine property at Edessa in what is now southern Turkey. Then the crusading, colonizing zeal began to fade. In less than a century, both Jerusalem and the lands were lost. There were more crusades, and often it was reported back to Rome that there was light at the end of this tunnel. But after another century, only a few footholds on the coast remained. Of these, Acre was the most important. Then on May 18, 1291, Acre came under final assault. Things were as in Algeria or Saigon or Angola 700 years on. An Israeli scholar recently observed that the principal terror weapon of the time, Greek fire, is the chemical and military antecedent of napalm. The attackers at Acre promised a bloodbath for any surviving Christians, and such promises in those days had to be taken very seriously. As later in Saigon, to have planned for an evacuation would have been to concede defeat in advance. So instead, at the last moment, there came the wholly anarchic rush to escape. Space was sold to the highest bidder. Fortunes changed hands during the course of that single night. Passage out was by ship, not uh, helicopter. The long shadow of colonialism has been mentioned and none is so long as that of the Crusades. It remained in the memory of Islam that man had come from afar with religious purpose and sanction to occupy Jerusalem and to take up the land. And it continued to be feared that one day they would come back. It was inevitable that any who did return would be viewed with the utmost hostility and especially so if they claimed religious sanction. It didn't matter too much whether those returning were Christians or Jews. The shadow of the Crusades is still over Israel. The people of the Levant had rallied to throw the Crusaders out. But in Europe, the crusading spirit, the colonizing spirit, had weakened. This was decisive. And this tendency to tire is a constant in the colonial idea. There was for long another constant. As enthusiasm waned as regards one region, it would wax as regards another. While the Crusaders had been going east, the Moors had been coming west and into Spain. In the same year that Spain freed herself from the Moors, whose architecture still enchants the visitor to southern Spain, she launched the greatest colonial effort after Rome. Its hub was here in Seville. Christopher Columbus was here in 1491 on a promotional trip, waiting for Isabella to finish with the Moors. With Spain, the colonial idea took on a definite administrative and intellectual form. <laughs> to rescue souls was still the avowed reason. And for those committed to that task, it was real. Colonial motivation was never simple, one-dimensional. But as Adam Smith observed, the pious purposes of converting the inhabitants to Christianity also sanctified the injustice of the project. The pious purpose was the cover story, a concept not invented by the CIA. The deeper purpose of the project was the enrichment of the colonists and the Spanish crown. The effort being Spanish, it was felt that the reward should be hers. So the Spanish colonial trade was monopolized by Spaniards. This was the mercantilist perception of the colonial idea, strongest always with Spain. Until 1717, the headquarters for colonial administration was here in Seville. 
This great square building was built in 1598 as the Stock Exchange, and later as the Archivo General de Indias. It came to house the paper produced by the colonial bureaucracy. Here the paper remains, neat row after row, room after room. By 1700, some 400,000 regulations governing colonial affairs had been issued. An effort in 1681 to consolidate and codify these had produced some 11,000 chapters. Those that applied, the colonial administrators were presumed to know and follow. The Spanish Empire may have survived only because its regulations were so numerous that no one imagined that they could be enforced. Thanks very much. Some of the surviving paper is an absolute delight. Here is a letter from Columbus himself, dated the 5th of February, 1505. It's to his son, Diego, and it deals with various family, financial, and business affairs. This letter is from Cortez in 1526. He describes his voyage from Havana by way of San Juan to Mexico, and he warns that there are some very rebellious tendencies in the New World. This one is dated 1539, and it's from Francisco Pizarro to the Queen of Spain. Pizarro says he is sending her some emeralds, and he very thoughtfully asks, that she acknowledged by receipt. Some authorities we saw earlier believe that Urban II launched the Crusades because he was attracted by the idea of having the Crusaders, whom many people thought a rather inconvenient set of ruffians, safely away from Europe and in the Holy Land. I think it's fair to say that any Spaniard who knew the Pizarro brothers well must have rejoiced at their being in Peru. These documents, this great pile of papers, tell their own tale about the eternal ways of bureaucracy. In 1654, as they tell, uh, one of the great cathedral churches of Mexico was badly in need of repairs and restoration. And permission was being sought to spend money to fix it up. Permission was still being sought 20 years later in 1672, and the matter was not disposed of for another 60 years. Eventually, like all the others, the Spanish Empire came to an end. Partly it was a revolt of the powerful colonists against the Spanish bureaucracy, which sought, among other things, to restrict their greed. Partly it was because the Spaniards, in common with all others, had ceased to believe that the colonies were worth the effort. Spain had come to rely on colonial troops for colonial defense, proof again of the diminishing interest. The Bonapartes, after 1808, did not command colonial loyalty. Why fight for a Corsican sovereign? Spanish decolonization, as was often the case, was in two stages. First came independence, power to those who had power in the colonies. Then, as in Mexico, Cuba, Peru, came the further revolt against those who had succeeded to power after the break with Spain, the great landlords, and also the foreigners in the church. This further revolution is one that still goes on. Spanish colonialism makes yet another point. The revolt, when it comes, will be against both the governing country and its colonial policy. The Spanish colonies were elaborately, meticulously governed, over-governed. This no one has thought to be true of independent Latin America. British colonialism, on the other hand, was informal, decentralized, relaxed, and the same was true of the colonial administration of the Dutch and in less than a measure that of the French. Until the last century, except for the special case of India, Britain didn't even have a central department 
for colonial affairs. This tradition, the British tradition, was far more open to the Smithian ideas which made both colonies and the colonists responsible for their own well-being. Colonial management in India was delegated, of course, to the East India Company, and this was its staff college at Haleybury near London. The company employed three of the great economists of the last century, Malthus, James Mill, and John Stuart Mill. But they joined with David Ricardo in opposing exclusive trading privileges for the company. The hand of government should be light, trade should be free. And so, relatively speaking, it was. In the Spanish colonies in 1776, the government of George III would have been thought a beacon of liberalism. In the time of Clive and Warren Hastings, the British motive in India was fairly candid. It was to trade, make money, you governed, kept order, showed the flag to such end. But with time, motives became more complex. It was a civilizing mission, a need to help a backward people. And above all, there was a concern for government and the rule of law. And these, we must be clear, came to have a specific place and power of their own. In 1856, two years before the East India Company gave way to direct British rule, a young Englishman came here to Haleybury to prepare for a career in India. His name was John Beams. Haleybury was a happy place, though rather a farce as far as learning was concerned. In fact, you might learn as much or as little as you liked. But while the facilities for not learning were considerable, those for learning were in practice somewhat scanty. The men, few in number, who really ground or mugged or sweated, euphemisms by which the use of the word work was avoided, were looked on by the majority as amiable but misguided enthusiasts and as fit objects for the more boisterous kinds of practical joking. A good many of the men were sons of members of the Indian civil and military services. In spite of this, however, there was little or nothing in the tone of the place or in our habits indicative of our connection with that country. It's obvious that Haley Berry did not turn out carefully disciplined bureaucrats in the Spanish mold, well-versed in Indian affairs. The graduates were meant to cope with whatever problems might arise by drawing on a liberal education and common sense. However, one should also allow for the possibility that Haley Berry had poor teachers and was badly run. No one should ever assume deep recondite purposes when there is such a good and everyday explanation as that. It was considered bad form to talk about India or to allude to the fact that we were all going there soon. All we knew was that it was beastly hot and that there were niggers there and that it would be time enough to bother about it when you got there. Beams got there in 1859. He was 22, and his first posting was to the Punjab, which had been subdued in the next only 10 years before. His district, a large one, was Gujarat, north and west of Lahore. He journeyed there by Dakgari and mail cart from Calcutta. Especially as regards his early life in India, Beams has something very close to total recall. I doubt that there is a better guide to the motivating forces in British colonialism in the last century or a better warning against oversimplification. The mail cart for Gujarat turned out to be a small box on two wheels. The seats were set with an iron rod so contrived that at every jolt it caught the passenger sharply in the back, inflicting acute pain. The coachman drove like Jehu, the son of Nimshi, he seldom slackened speed and very nearly drove over everyone and everything he met. Thus we went on and on, jolting and bumping over the rough half-finished roads. At length we crossed the broad Chenab, and after seven more miles of the agonizing bumping, we suddenly stopped in the mist at a lonely little post house on a broad plain. The coachman threw down my valise and bag. As I looked surprised, he explained that this was Gujarat, 
I got down and stood stupidly staring while the driver gave a terrific blast on his bugle and vanished into the darkness, leaving me half-frozen, bewildered and aching in every limb by the roadside. A sleepy policeman with a lantern came out and took my bags. This was Gujarat. It was four in the morning of the 7th of March, 1859. It had taken me 24 days from Calcutta, a distance by road of about 1,250 miles, or perhaps a little more. It was now necessary, as the first thing, to find a roof to shelter myself under. After going a short distance, we came suddenly on the Duck Bungalow, the stranger's natural home in an Indian station. I saw a room within and a bed in it, on which I incontinently flung myself and fell asleep immediately. When I awoke, it was broad daylight, and I was lying just where I'd thrown myself a few hours before, greasy, aching all over, with a parched mouth and a swimming head. So I fell to shouting, Koi hey! till a greasy Muslim appeared with a cup of tea. This done, one greasier even than himself brought several earthen jars of cold water. I stripped, bathed and scrubbed and deluged myself with water till the aching left my limbs. I put on clean clothes and felt myself a new man. Now at last, Beams met his superior officer. Beams had been appointed as assistant magistrate and collector which is to say, general deputy to the man who ruled the region, served as judge, and collected his taxes. The titles tell of two major preoccupations of the British in India by this time. Government, meaning mostly fair taxation, and the law. Presently, a thick curtain was lifted, and the deputy commissioner, Major Robert Roy Adams, came out. He shook hands cordially and said, where have you come from, and what powers have you got? I did not understand what he meant by powers, so I simply said that I had just arrived from Calcutta and that this was my first district. Adams, ignoring in true Punjab style the possibility of anyone being tired or wishing to do anything but work, said, Now let us go to court. Whereupon a chaprasi brought a pistol in a belt, which he bade me put on. He advised me to wear it always, except in my own house. And this caution was not unnecessary, for it was not unusual in those days for European officers to be fired at by Muslim fanatics. Poor Adams himself met his death in that way a few years later. Let me interrupt Beams to observe that he has let us in on a secret here. There is already dissidence, resistance in his district. But note the certainty and contempt with which he dismisses it, fanatics. He and his colleagues were engaged in good and virtuous work, and who could be opposed? In the middle of a plain, dotted here and there with groups of suitors waiting for the courts to open, was his courthouse, a large, long, and not very hideous building. Adams led me first to his own court, a roughly furnished room full of native clerks who all rose and saluted, bowing almost to the ground as we entered. Here I was sworn in with the oaths which it was still the custom to administer in those days and signed a certificate to the effect that I had that day in the forenoon assumed charge of my office. Then he said in his sharp, jerky way, This is your court. These are your clerks. Now go to work. And before I could open my mouth, he had turned and abruptly left the room. This was throwing one into one's work with a vengeance. Here was I, as ignorant of the whole business as a child, with a hundred questions to ask and no one to ask them from. Of law and procedure, I, of course, knew nothing. However, no time was to be lost. The head man rose and said, These are the cases on your honour's file for trial. What is your order? The people were already staring at me rather wonderingly as I hesitated for a minute. I said as by instinct, call up the first case. Though what I was to do with it, I knew as little as the man in the moon. He smiled, as who should say, guessed right first time. <laughs> 
He mentioned some names to an Amla who went out onto the veranda and bawled loudly for some minutes. <laughs> Then entered a dirty, greasy shopkeeper, the plaintiff. He spoke Punjabi, of which I could understand not one word. But the Sarish Tada translated it into Hindustani as he spoke, so I got on wonderfully well. I was furnished with a printed form and requested to fill in certain columns. By four o'clock, I had disposed of all my cases. I went to bed intensely tired, but very much interested in and pleased with my day's experience. For some in this world, the light, and for some, the darkness. In colonial Spain, the saving of souls and the collecting of treasure were the preoccupations of different men. And so it was in India. Beams was always of the light, not religion, but government. He went on to serve in Bengal, and 14 years after his arrival, was in charge of Katak in Orissa and the large surrounding district. The great charm of the work of civil officers in India is its variety. In the course of one day's work, one has a dozen or more different things to do, each presenting some new feature of interest. So that if one goes to bed very tired at night, it is not the depressing weariness of sameness or drudgery, but the healthy fatigue of keeping mind and body on the stretch with a multitude of ever-varying calls on one's attention. And the joy, than which I know no greater, of feeling that one is working and ruling and making oneself useful in God's world. We got up at five or thereabouts, drank a cup of tea while the horse was being brought, and I went for my ride. The morning ride was the ritual of the Indian civil service, still sometimes practiced. As an ambassador there, I was once persuaded for some weeks to the custom. It was a terrible thing for the horse. In those days, it was more than exercise. It was also government. A look at the fields and paddies, the new irrigation canals, and an example of early rising vigilance to the police and the soldiers. Governing men is grand work the noblest of all occupations, though perhaps the most difficult. But as I acquired by degrees more experience and greater familiarity with those petty but indispensable matters of routine which hang about all work, I began to feel my strength and enjoy my duties more. Returning about 6.30, my wife and I had our regular chota haziri in the veranda. Our little girls, who had been for a ride on their ponies, played around us. Then I went round our beautiful garden and gave orders. About seven, the post came in and we looked at our letters, discussed any matters requiring arrangement, and read the paper, The Englishman, the leading journal in Bengal in those days. At 10, bath and breakfast and off to court in my broom, a drive of three miles, during which I read official letters or thought over the day's business. Our instructions were to decide all cases by the light of common sense and our own sense of what was just and right. On reaching office about 11, the first thing was to take the Fawjdari or magistrate's work. The public crowded into my large courtroom and presented many petitions, each of which was read to me by a clerk and orders passed thereon. Now followed interviews with the head clerks of each department. Magistrate's office, excise, stamps, treasury, customs, salt, road cess, municipal, education, registration, land revenue. Each man brought those papers on which orders were required, took his orders and departed. When they had gone, I wrote replies to letters from the commissioner, board and other officials, and was usually a good deal hindered and interrupted by deputy collectors and other offices coming in to speak to me about this or that. Generally, however, by two o'clock, the correspondence was finished. Whether it was or not, at two, we had tiffin, and we wanted it. <laughs> 
At this meal, the joint magistrate, the deputy commissioner, and the district superintendent of police joined me. And while we ate, we talked shop and got through a good deal of business. There was paperwork here, too, but with a difference. The Spanish paper was regulations, requests, reports on compliance. British paper was the record of past action, proof of correct and just procedure, and the assurance of just future action. By four o'clock, the work was done, and I went home. Around six, I drove with my wife. Our drive generally ended at the club, where we met nearly everyone in the station, both men and women. That was another confession. A superior and exclusive caste had been formed by the colonists. It seemed wholly innocent on the veranda, but the reaction from beyond the hedge or fence, especially from the rich, educated, and cultivated Indians, the Nehru's and the Gandhi's, was something else again. About 7.30, we drove home to dinner and were generally in bed and asleep soon after nine. There were also things in India that the happy few on the veranda could not see. And didn't see even when, in accordance with a wise custom, they carried justice and tax collection out to the countryside. They couldn't see local abuse and mismanagement of Indians by Indians. And in time, this would act strongly against the foreign rulers, and especially in some of the princely states where mismanagement was sometimes accepted as a matter of policy. The poorer classes of the rural population were very heavily oppressed. We did our best to protect them, but a mere handful of foreigners in so large a country cannot even hear of many of the things that are done behind their backs. John Beams was probably more efficient in dealing with British than with Indian abuse. In 1866, a British indigo planter was accused of terrorizing his peasants. Beams moves strongly against him. He shows how remote he was from those who were in India to make money and also how superior he felt to those so concerned. It was not from mere lust of power that I insisted on being master of my district and having my own way in all things, but because the district was a sacred trust delivered to me by the government, and I was bound to be faithful to that charge. I should have been very base had I, from love of ease or wish for popularity, sat idly by and let others usurp my place and my duties. Ruling men is not a task that can be performed by le premier venu. And though I was comparatively young at it, still I had had five years training and experience prefaced by a liberal education, while these ex-mates of merchant ships and ci-devant clerks in counting houses had had neither. I had to do my duty according to my lights. The rule of law extended to the far corners of India. To this distant village came the court and the call, all with petitions to be heard, drawn eye. In the half century following Beam's arrival in the Punjab, India was, I believe, to the standards of the time, one of the better governed countries of the world. Persons and property were safe, thought and speech were secure, more secure than in recent times. There was effective action to irrigate land, arrest famine, docks, roads, bridges were built. Railways, also built as a defense against local famine, spanned the subcontinent. courts functioned in the main impartially and to the very great pleasure of the litigiously minded Indians 
all was accomplished by an incredibly small number of people. The Indian Civil Service never enrolled more than a thousand Europeans at any one time in its history. The cost of government is no detail in a country where everyone is poor, nor is justice in the collection of rents and taxes. The Raj for its time was also very efficient in building irrigation works, encouraging railways, and in enforcing law and order, religious peace in particular. It was an infinitely better government than that of the corrupt, anarchic, exploitive, undisciplined despots that the British had replaced. Once in a relaxed conversation, I asked Nehru, when should the British have left? What was the optimal year? He exploded. They never had any business being in our country. I reminded him that P.C. Mahalanobis, the great statistician and a mutual friend, had said that for the first century, the British were seen as liberators in Bengal. Nehru subsided and smiled and conceded the point. He said, well, they should have been gone after the First World War. India was the great test. The British were race conscious, clubby, <clears throat> sometimes arrogant. But those like beams that gave their lives to India were greatly respected by the people they ruled. And they in turn loved India, the grandeur of its people and its culture and its scene. As this remarkable building, the Royal Pavilion here at Brighton, so wonderfully attests. There was never so nostalgic a club as that of the old India hands. I know for I'm myself a kind of modern honorary member. But like all efforts by one people to rule another at a distance, this one too failed. What was it that turned the confident assertion of a right and a duty into a rush pell-mell to get out? History has few neat turning points, and colonialism in India is an exception. The zenith of imperial power was the great Durbar in Delhi in 1911 attended by the new king emperor and his queen. Hollywood apart, the modern world has not elsewhere seen such pomp, such pageantry. The surviving feudal rulers came to pay homage to their master. The forces that would act to expel the ruler were already present. Those that would weaken his will would very soon follow. The wars were just ahead. World War I would weaken, destroy the old ruling classes in Europe that were the strongest defenders of the colonial idea. Also the empires within Europe, as we'll see next time. And both wars would create a heavy obligation of the rulers to the ruled. The train of ideas and events was in motion, slowly but inexorably. No empire ever had such a resource in colonial manpower, disciplined, intelligent, numerous, to which to turn. Its use in the two wars created a strong moral obligation to concede self-government and independence to those who had served so well. Some saw the obligation the other way around. The troops should defend the empire against the Congress party. In France, in Libya, and in Burma, Indian troops have given their lives fighting for a cause they know to be just. They represent the spirit of India, not the Congress mob. A mob swayed by the eloquence of their leaders into falsely believing that an India without England would be an India for the Indians. But it would be an in India without England. I'm an economist. As a matter of trade union pride, I look very carefully for economic causation. I do not think economics had much to do with Indian independence. Englishmen were there to make money, but the money makers were not at the center of the tension or resentment. There were English capitalists, but by the time of independence, there were also great Indian capitalists, too. The English firms were not, I think, regarded much differently from the Indian firms. Some have seen independence as a reaction against capitalist exploitation. If that was so, the Tatas and the Burlas would not have survived 
and they've survived very well. The station stops that led to independence were the wars, the growing self-confidence of the Indian elite, the men and women who had been educated for independence at Oxford and Cambridge, the London School of Economics, the belief, the very persuasive belief, that modern governments could do more than provide law and order, build canals and railroads, an idea that came also from England. But the most important of all was the indignity of feeling and the tension and the misunderstanding that develops when one people govern another and a different people at a great distance. Why, Indians asked, do we have to go to London for our rulers? Why not our own, ourselves? That, above all, was the fuel that powered the train. Clement Attlee would dispatch Mountbatten, the last viceroy with a timetable. Lord Mountbatten was to act with soldierly and viceregal force, to be a man of will. He was to show that the will to stay was now gone. Viscount Radcliffe, not out of knowledge of India, but out of a reputation for judicial impartiality, again the law, was given the task of dividing the subcontinent, the only solution that seemed to allow of immediate independence. India, Pakistan, barriers now between. As ever, there was the nasty end. Partly it was the nature of the solution. There was no way to divide India neatly, Muslims here, Sikhs and Hindus there. So millions ended up on the wrong side. So there had to be migrations, and the movement was intensified by fear. In Spain, the reaction was against over-government. The first casualty here was the law by which this colonial power had set such overwhelming store. For centuries, Hindus and Muslims had given much careful thought to means for provoking each other. Noisy music outside the mosques, cow slaughter. There was much grim history to redeem. Now was the time for settling the old scores. The law was gone. was the greatest physical symbol of British achievement in India. Now it was the scene of the greatest revolt against British law and order. stations were the focus of some of the most intimate acts of cruelty of modern times. Muslims slaughtered Sikhs and Hindus, and Sikhs and Hindus slaughtered Muslims, and this they did with clubs and knives by hand. Trainloads of fleeing refugees were ambushed, and the passengers killed, every man, woman, and child. For days, the trains of dead arrived at the stations near the border, as here at Lahore, carrying bloody cargoes from both sides. No one here could doubt that India was affirming the first fact of colonialism, the bad end. This was the symbol of law in Lahore, the great bronze statue of Victoria. In 1947, as the dead lay in the station, someone seems to have sensed the current reality. 
An unknown hand, Indian or Pakistani, put a black wreath at her feet. What was probably the best effort had the worst end, or as bad as any. But there were many more. The same resentment against government from a distance, the people from a distance, the weakened will to stay, the disorderly exit here from Algeria. This too was an intimate and bloody conflict. France, more than any other colonial power, treated its colonists as equals. And the French colonial peoples never questioned the depth and charm of French culture, that Paris was the center of the universe. This did not save French colonialism. The French had settled in Algeria, the Pierre Noir, but back to France. The Congo, too, had a messy end. This was true even though the Belgians saw the end coming, saw it coming more clearly than any others and acted in advance. The Russians had to leave Katanga. The Chinese had to leave Ghana. Ideologies may differ, also the scale of the effort. The result is the same. Especially it was the same for the Russians in China. And eventually the Portuguese had to leave Angola, a very sudden weakening of the will to stay. The old Portuguese heroes suffer. The Portuguese do not stay to see. For Americans, there was Vietnam. The end there should not have been surprising. There had been a notable local warning. Unfortunately, not one American in a thousand, and even fewer Englishmen, know that at the close of the last century, Rudyard Kipling lived here in southern Vermont. The house he built is still here, a large, rather spooky Victorian affair. No one knew more about colonialism than Kipling. No one had celebrated it more powerfully or worn more trenchantly of its dangers. In this room, which was his study and which is pretty much unchanged since that time, Kipling wrote two of his most famous works, The Jungle Books and Captains Courageous. Having lived in America, Kipling felt free to give advice when our colonial adventures began. That was in 1899 when the Spanish-American War brought us the Philippines. No one then blushed to speak of white men and their responsibility, but better that they should know what to expect. And Kipling told of this in what was perhaps his most famous verse. Take up the white man's burden, the savage wars of peace. Fill full the mouth of famine and bid the sickness cease. Go make them with your living and mark them with your dead. Take up the white man's burden and reap his old reward. The blame of those ye better, the hate of those ye guard. The hate came soon enough with the Philippine insurrection, a nasty, frustrating struggle. But the really savage war of peace for Americans came a lot later in Vietnam. In Vietnam, only the words were different. One guy got on. As at Acre, they came with the cash. This time it was for space on the planes and helicopters. These were faster than the galleys, and the trip was over more quickly. By this much had colonial enterprise, effort to govern shape development from afar, changed in 700 years. <laughs> <laughs> 
helicopters landed on the terriers and there was no space. So they went overboard as previously had the illusions of a compelling mission, as previously had the will to stay. At Acre, in Spanish America, in India, Algeria, China, it had all happened before. This time it could be watched on television. Does the colonial experience belong forever to history? Well, I for one think that it does. The United States has some very badly burned fingers. And so we should remember, does the other superpower, the Soviet Union. The last 20 or 30 years, the Soviets have sought to extend their influence to China, Indonesia, Egypt, Ghana, elsewhere in Africa and Asia, and contemplating the results, they can hardly feel pleased. When Ben Bella, a Soviet acolyte, was deposed in Algeria, I remember a Russian newspaper correspondent saying to me, rather sadly, they even used our tanks. Well, at least they didn't use our advisors. The Soviets, too, have experienced the blame of those ye better. I expect there's now a volume of Kipling in the Kremlin. But though colonialism is dead, the scars will remain for a long while. The old colonial powers are now the rich industrial lands and the former colonies, their former colonies are the poor countries of the world. And colonialism gets the blame for this poverty. Sometimes it gets the blame when local failure the absence of conscientious and honest efforts by local governments and local politicians might be a more useful explanation. The colonial experience also deeply colors relations between the rich countries and the poor. This experience and the difference in wealth supports the case that the rich countries have an obligation to help the poor. It's an obligation to which I strongly subscribe, but it is not an easy obligation to assume, even when the, when the will and the money are available. You keep your hands off, do not advise, wait to be asked, and then you will be thought indifferent. Or you are forthcoming, interested, involved, you urge what you think is right, and then you risk being called a neo-colonialist. It's a delicate line, and to this delicacy I can testify from experience as ambassador in India. My instinct was to get involved, very much involved. And in consequence, the late Krishna Menon, in a memoir, remembered me principally as a man who yearned to be the new viceroy. A very dangerous ambition, and I had been warned, because I had read my Kipling, 